Frenchie. Can you control her, please? I do not control her. Episode 6 of Season 1 of The Boys is called The Innocence, which from what I can tell is a reference to the main plot development revealed in this episode by Mother's Milk. Samaritan's Embrace, a religious charity led by Ezekiel, has been bankrolled by Vought as a front to ship fake vaccinations that are actually doses of Compound V to 53 hospitals across the country. This is something they have been doing since 1971 to create a steady supply of super-powered individuals, with the best ones getting tapped to be corporate cash cows for Vought. Despite this plot development being a key point for the plot of the season, the audience's understanding of the world, and what the characters will do next, this episode doesn't offer much in the way of dramatic action or much else to push the plot forward. I wouldn't say that this episode is a filler episode, but the pace of it is definitely different from a lot of the more memorable dramatic antics of the season. There aren't major WTF moments that can go viral online like Homeland plane incident, the strategy the boys use to end translucent, or babies with laser eyes. Episode 6 is largely focused on characters and peeling back even more of their layers. At the micro level, we learn more about the backstories and emotional state or progression of a multitude of characters on both the sides of the boys and the seven. At the macro level, we learn far more about the massive scale of Vought, not only for the child in endangerment, human experimentation, drug trafficking, and financial fraud, but for how deep their tendrils go, and how truly sociopathic they are about their business and the clients they manage. So let's start with the bad, and we'll gradually make our way out of that until we end things on a high note. Dozens of people in this company spent hundreds of hours to create the thing that is you. The big reveal of Vought's Compound V conspiracy doesn't just extend generally to any and all characters we meet with superpowers. In the case of Homelander, we are finally introduced to his origin story. Contrary to Vought's manufactured publicity campaign of Homelander having an all-American upbringing, the reality is that he was more so a lab rat. What I love about the way they incorporate this into the story is that Homelander is the type of villain that could easily come across as one-dimensional if he were to appear in a feature film. He's so cartoony with his peculiar mannerisms, outlandish crimes, and even his flag cape. This backstory in a feature film would probably get a brief mention, perhaps in a villain monologue in the third act, or in an exposition monologue by a hero in the first act. But because this is a television series, and a truly excellent one at that, the pacing of introducing Homelander and building up the dimensions of both his public persona and his real character are done very effectively. Being raised entirely in a lab is important context to understanding not only his immoral actions, but his generally peculiar tendencies as well. That mummy complex is starting to make a lot more sense now, isn't it? I'll spare you the ramblings about developmental psychology since we have a lot of characters to get through, but Homelander in many ways works as a mascot, or even the very embodiment of Vought's corporate infrastructure. The other members of the Seven, many of whom have some sort of villainous tarnish because you don't get to spend this much time in this group without getting your hands dirty, all have some sort of redeeming quality or a connection to their originally good intentions, or even the relationships they have outside of this corporate world. Homelander is the only one who doesn't. But this is how Vought operates. They want to keep taking from their heroes and use them in whatever way they see fit. Maeve's ex-girlfriend shows up to a filming session and Maeve asks for privacy to talk to her. That request is denied. A-Train opens up about how he first learned that he had superpowers. And when I was three, it's like these guys started shooting in front of my building and I outran the damn bullet. After all of these episodes of building A-Train up as a fairly villainous character, we get to learn something deeper about him and how he came to be a superhero at Vought. But how do the corporate figures react to this moment of earnest insight to his origins? Can I stop you right there for a second? What if we ixnay the gun violence, maybe make it a click more upbeat? 
I guess this was one thing they didn't know how to spin into something motivational, or maybe they just didn't want to. Gee, wonder why that could be. Anyway, one of the main points of insight into Vought in this episode is their handling of the aftermath of Annie's confession on stage at the Believe Expo. She was brave enough to speak up about not only feeling lost and vulnerable, but to also say that she was assaulted. Despite not naming her attacker publicly, in Vought's eyes, the damage is done. She dared to go off script. Then why don't you burn the sparkly outfit and become a cop? You want to be a superhero. You want to be famous. Let's take a moment to unpack this statement, because not only are we getting to see how much of a mastermind Madeline Stilwell is behind manufacturing the images and personas for these superheroes, we see how skilled of a manipulator she is. She's already been playing mind games, among other things, with Homelander, but now she is pushing Annie to question her own character and integrity. If Vought has to go through such extreme lengths to try to get their heroes into the military, how are we supposed to believe that there are already established channels for superheroes to use their abilities in an official capacity in professions like law enforcement? But part of great writing, particularly when you want to create a hero and have them prove their worth in a story, is to test them. Annie more than proves herself worthy when she stands her ground against Madeline's efforts to strong arm her. Why don't you cut the petulant diva shit, show a little fucking gratitude, and let us do our job? No. Annie is tested as a hero by having her lifelong dream come true where she gets to join the Seven, but it ends up being not all that she thought it would be. It's by no means easy to figure out what to do next, but she finds strength, perhaps of who she already is, or perhaps it's who she has become as a result of her experiences and relationships, or maybe it's all of the above. But perhaps the most unsettling development in the aftermath of Annie's public declaration is anything and everything to do with the deep in this episode. I just don't know to whom you're referring. Oh, I think you know. I think you've known for a long time. It's not particularly surprising that this was not the Deep's first time assaulting women, or that Vought was aware of these transgressions, but the show takes it a step further. They show the many attempts to film his strategic PR statement to try to get ahead of his actions. This ends up being one of the most unsettling things you see Vought do in the present day storyline of this episode. I'm in full support of women and their ongoing bravery in speaking out. I'm sorry, let me, let me start that over. I'm in full support of women and their ongoing bravery. Butcher brings Huey to a support group of people that have been harmed by soups for one reason or another. One detail I failed to fully appreciate until I rewatched this episode as part of my larger rewatch of this season is that this man in the support group, Seth, is the same guy from Vought's marketing team that was present to help give Annie her first pitch for her new image. But Butcher brings Huey to this meeting to try to get him back on track with his anti-soup vendetta. He's trying really hard to keep Huey from getting so emotionally invested in Annie, but it's not working very well. Butcher has a very aggressive fixation about stopping Vought and bringing down this larger idolization of soups. Where's your fucking rage? Your self-respect? We as an audience have known for a while now that there are very clear parallels between Butcher and Huey since they've both lost women they loved to Vought superheroes. But this marks a turning point in their relationship since Butcher finally tells Huey about his wife. This works really well for a number of reasons. If you want to be cynical, you could argue that Butcher is just trying to use whatever means he has to get Huey refocused on the mission at hand, but he's already brought him to the support group. My interpretation of this conversation and the implications of it is that Butcher does care about Huey in his own twisted way and sees Huey as a more innocent version of himself. As for Huey, he is a kind, empathetic person, so it's understandable that learning the truth about Butcher's origins of why he's doing all of this would make him feel even more conflicted about being with Annie while also working with the boys. Even if he is finally starting to feel more closure about losing Robin. Uncle Elmo, you talk to me? She talked to me. 
If you've been following along with the videos I've been doing about the boys, then it should not surprise you in the slightest that I would save the best for last by putting Frenchie and Kimiko's portion of the story at the end of this video. Kimiko is a character that's more shrouded in mystery than anyone, including Homelander, due to her lack of speaking. She hasn't been able to tell them about where she came from or how she got her powers. We know Frenchie is clever about building weapons and he likes to follow his instincts, even if that means doing the exact opposite of what the rest of the team wants him to do. However, we get to see another dimension to his sharp mind when he is able to talk Mother's Milk into helping them seek out Mesmer to help reveal Kimiko's origins. And he does this by pointing out what type of person Mother's Milk is. Frenchie knows exactly which buttons to push to make Mother's Milk a willing participant in this plan. Because you cannot bear things out of order. And she, she's out of order. Mesmer is another testament to the show's excellent writing and fits in well with this episode's recurring pattern of character exploration across this larger ensemble of characters. This is the first time we've heard of him, let alone met him, but we still get a lot of information about his run as a hero, what went wrong, his failures as a father, and all of it contextualizes his decision at the very end of the episode to give up his chance to rebuild his relationship with his daughter so he can instead sell out the boys to Vought in the hopes of getting back his glory days. What does that mean? It's the flag of the Shining Light Liberation Army. Frenchie? You're dating a terrorist. The entire sequence of events of Frenchie looking after Kimiko and coming up with a plan to share her story is my favorite part of this episode. It adds another dimension to not only Frenchie and Kimiko as characters, but to how evil Vought's methods are to increasing their power. Not only have they engineered drugs to create their own superheroes, they are also making supervillains for those heroes to fight. Kimiko never intended to get superpowers any more than she planned to end up in a cage in an underground lair. She saved my life! She's not bad! She just wants to go home! Though this episode may not be as eventful or bombastic in the traditional sense for action sequences or jaw-dropping plot twists, it's an important part of the larger story. You get to climb a little bit deeper into these characters and explore their layers and nuances. In a show that garners so much attention for creating spectacles, credit should be given for how much range it has to pull off an episode like this without any of those spectacles. It fosters an emotional intimacy between the characters and in their relationship with the audience. Bonjour, Kimiko. Thanks for watching everyone, if you are new here feel free to watch the other videos I've done on the boys for season 1, I've got two more episodes to do before season 2 premieres so I hope you'll stick around to watch, see you in the next one, bye! I wonder if she lives by the water.